we are very happy to have uh, today Esteban Rossi Hansberg with us. Esteban uh, is a professor at Princeton, and as the typical introduction goes, he needs no introduction. So I'm not going to take a long time to do this. I will just remind everybody the rules of the game. Esteban will be talking for 45 minutes. Then we will have 15 minutes for a discussion at the end. During the presentation, you can send your questions to the Q&A or through the chat. Uh, Jose Luis Cruz will be handling some of them. And the, the panelists can uh, just jump in whenever they want and uh, ask questions. And Esteban will be handling us and uh, taking care that uh, we let him speak most of the time. So Esteban, uh, really glad to have you here with us. And uh, you will tell us about this economic geography of global warming. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this sounds like an exciting uh, seminar series. So we think this paper fits well uh, within it. So the idea is to study the economic effects of uh, global warming in a, in a kind of a spatial context. And I should say that this is joint work, uh, work with Jose Luis uh, Cruz, who's a student at Princeton and who is right here, ready to answer all your chat questions. So fire away. Okay, so the idea is to, to build like an assessment model, a model to try to understand the economic effects of, uh, of climate change. And, and so stepping back a little bit, uh, when you think about how, what type of uh, assessment model you wanna, you wanna write down or you wanna construct, uh, the key thing is to think about the, the, the basic characteristics of uh, global warming, uh, and which is, of course, just one part of, uh, of, of the whole phenomenon of climate change, and that's the part that I'm going to be talking about uh, today. So global warming is a, is a protracted in the sense that it happens very kind of relatively slowly and over many, many years of time global, because it affects the whole world, uh, phenomena, um, but that it's also very heterogeneous. It's going to have very heterogeneous local effects. And these are kind of key characteristics of this phenomenon that we need to take into account. And the literature in general has focused a lot on the fact that it's protracted, that is, you know, a dynamic phenomenon over, over many years. And of course, that it's a global, that carbon emissions are a global externality, but much less on the, the fact that effects are very heterogeneous uh, in space. And so if you think, uh, if you look at the standard climate models out there, they tend to essentially postulate an aggregate damage function by which climate affects, uh, you know, economic outcomes directly. Uh, in general, it's an, an aggregate function. And it's a function that in some sense, because it's not disaggregated, because it's not built up, from individual agents making decisions in many cases, it doesn't incorporate all these behavioral responses. And as such, it doesn't incorporate real economic adaptation. The fact that when things happen, right, agents react to those things that happen. And in particular, when climate change happens, that's gonna lead to a bunch of behavioral responses. Agents are gonna react to the phenomena and, uh, and, and we want to kind of incorporate those reactions. And we want to in particular incorporate those reactions across space, thinking that, you know, agents are in a particular context, in a particular location in the world, and they have the ability to move, to trade, to invest uh, in different places. And we want to incorporate those type of mechanisms into the analysis of this phenomenon. In particular, kind of a key one is migration, as I'll be emphasizing, which I guess you know, fits perfectly with the, the main topic of uh, this seminar. Okay, so that's it. That's the goal, kind of bringing those type of adaptation mechanisms into a dynamic kind of spatial model. This is a relatively short uh, seminar, so, so I'm not going to go into all the, the nitty-gritty of the model. For those of you that know this literature a little bit, we are going to be using this paper with Klaus Desmet and David Nagy that we have, uh, where we kind of introduce a spatial growth model. And the way uh, that spatial growth model essentially works is kind of, uh, or we try to portray that in this diagram that you see that you see here. And so the black part of the diagram is what's in that original paper. 
And then the green part is what we're kind of adding in this paper. So that, so the model essentially, you know, regions have particular characteristics. So they have a, a location in space, which determines, you know, the cost of trading with other locations. They have a particular characteristics. So they have some amenities. So that determine how nice it is to live in those areas. They have a productivity level that determines how productive firms are in those uh, areas. And so agents decide where they want to live, uh, decide a firm and, and firms, you know, decide how they want to produce and, you know, they pay each other uh, wages and the two basic inputs of production are uh, land and labor. Now, this is an economy in which these agents are going to face migration costs from moving somewhere else. So they, they can move somewhere else, but it's frictional, costly for them to move so, somewhere else. And so they'll do it if it's uh, beneficial for them. And the way that paper models migration costs is in a way that is reversible. And that's kind of important to make the spatial dynamic model somewhat tractable. So let me say a couple of things about that. So think about me. So I was born in Mexico. I moved to the US. And so the way this is gonna work is when I do that, when I move to the U.S., I start paying a flow cost of having moved to the U.S., right? And I pay that flow cost as long as I'm in the U.S. So if I spend my, the rest of my life in the U.S., I'm going to spend that flow cost throughout my life. And so you can think about that as, you know, the cost of migration, but just pay, you know, as an annuity, if you will. Now, if I, you know, go to, from here to move to Germany, then uh, I would then start paying a cost of moving to Germany. And then again, I would pay that flow, right? Now, but, and so and we're going to make that cost of moving, say, from Mexico to the United States, make it such that it's log separable. So it has like a location like or origin fixed effect and a destination effect. And those are log additive. And so what that means is that, you know, because there's no cost of migration if you stay in the same location. That essentially implies that uh, if I go back to Mexico, I just stop paying. That cancels out that flow that I was paying in the U.S. And so the migration, migration costs stop. And so my migration of moving to the U.S. is like this flow while I stay there. Now, that has the big advantage of making these costs essentially reversible, these migration decisions reversible which simplifies the dynamic problem uh, quite a bit. So it's constantly in that form that I described, but agents can kind of move around, around space. And the other key comp component is that firms are going to be producing in a particular location. They're going to trade with other locations, as in kind of the quantitative trade literature, uh, but they can also innovate. They can improve the technology uh, in the location where they are. And so there's going to be competition for land in those locations. And so that's going to imply that firms, when they decide how much to invest, they are essentially going to maximize the, the bid rent that they have for that particular land in order to win the ability to produce in that, in that piece of land. And so that's going to lead to a growth model kind of or a spatial growth model in which firms are going to be investing in technology. Technology is going to be evolving over time. Okay. So that's kind of in a nutshell that original model that we're going to kind of is going to be the core of what I'm going to show you. What are we going to add to it? Well, the first thing is we're going to add another factor of production, energy. So energy together with land and labor are going to be now the three factors of production. And energy in turn is going to be produced with clean energy and uh, fossil fuels. So things that, you know, generate CO2 emissions. So the consumption of uh, fossil fuels or the use of fossil fuels is going to lead to CO2 emissions, which in turn are going to add to the carbon stock, which in turn is going to increase global temperatures, which in turn is going to affect local temperatures through some downscaling model that I'll show you in a second. Okay, And these local temperatures are key because these local temperatures then are going to feed back into productivity. So we're going to estimate the effect of local temperatures on local productivities. And so that's going to be one of the effects of rising uh, temperatures. And then uh, 
these local temperatures are also going to affect the amenities. So how nice it is to live in a particular location. So and they're going to do so differentially depending on the temperature in those locations. I'll show you that in a minute. And they're also going to affect natality rates. So by natality rates, we mean the birth rate minus the death rate. And so we're going to allow temperature to also affect that following the work of Greenstone and others. OK, and so that's going to lead to particular uh, natality rate in, in the different locations. And it matters where these agents, of course, are born because of the migration costs, because, you know, in some sense, it makes it hard for them to move. So if you are, you know, if you're born in a place where you don't want to move at all, that uh, is very different than if you are born in a place where, you know, you want to kind of move immediately out of or that, or that is already very congested, et cetera. OK, so. So that's kind of the model in a nutshell. We're going to take this model. We're going to quantify it for the world economy at a one degree by one degree level. So that's think about it as squares of 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers in the equator. It varies, like the size varies a little bit, but well, varies as you move uh, to the poles. And we're going to, and our baseline year is going to be uh, year 2000. And so the way this works is essentially you set up the model, you have data on population and income, and you can think about inverting this model. So namely, what are the fundamental productivities and amenities that make the model exactly match the population and income data in year 2000 at that level of resolution? Okay, so that's going to give us these fundamentals. And then we also need to specify the interactions through trade relationships and you know these migration costs we also need to specify what is kind of the local the cost of kind of exiting a particular location if you will and so the way we're going to do that is we're going to you know trade is going to satisfy essentially a gravity equation and so we're going to use parameters so that the model essentially follows a, a, a standard gravity equation as in the quantitative trade literature it's, it's like an ek model inside this and then um, uh, into an important model inside this. And then for migration flows, we're going to do it such that the model exactly replicates the uh, net migration flows between 2000 and 2005. Okay, so those are, we're going to choose the migration. And so the, so, and so the model has the flexibility to do that exactly, right? So because we're getting a migration cost by location, okay? So that flow we're getting exactly right, okay? And then, you know, we, we'll do other things for, in order to get the natality relationship between with income and temperature. We're going to use some of the estimates in the literature. I think I'll have something about that in, in a sec. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask one quick question on, on the overall, uh, on the overview of the, of the model? Of course. Which, which is whether you've considered thinking about innovation affecting energy production, right? Because many of the innovation is in clean energy, right? And yeah. you seem to be abstracting from this, but I was wondering. So that's a that's a good question. We so the way the way the model is going to work is so there's these firms, right, that are innovating purposely. I mean, they, in order to maximize uh, their profits at the local level, right? But that's for production. That's not for the production of energy, which is what you're pointing now. And so what we're going to do is, so that's going to imply that technology is going to be moving along in the, in the world, right? And we're going to allow that to affect also the technology for uh, clean energy and uh, fossil fuels. Uh, but just as a kind of as an externality, the world invents stuff, moves the, the technological frontier, and that helps you in terms of both types of fossil fuel. And in fact, we're going to allow that to be differential so as to match the increasing use of clean energy over time. But uh, so that's the way we're going to, the model is going to match that. But, uh, but it, it's, not, it's, it's not that, you know, there's no in, endogenous innovation in that sector. We can, in principle, incorporate that, but it has some challenges that we haven't quite solved. So, so far, we're doing it through the mechanism that, as, as I explained. But, it's a, but I think it's a, it's a potential area in which more work is needed for sure. I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess what I had in mind is potential role for policies, right? Like, uh, definitely. You know, multi, so, multi uh, lateral agencies or whatever. Definitely. Right? So, so, so we're going to, our policies, when, when we do the policy analysis, 
it's going to affect incentives for use of different types of energy, but it's not going to affect incentives to innovate in different parts of energy. So that effect is only going to be indirect through innovation in other industries. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of that, but, but only indirectly through the other industry. Uh, okay, cool. So like I said, we have this model, right, of, um, of uh, so there's going to be energy use. Energy use is going to lead to like a carbon cycle by which these CO2 emissions are going to lead to increases in the carbon stock, which in turn are going to feed back into global temperatures. That kind of carbon cycle is standard in the literature. We're going to use the IPCC 2013 uh, one. And you know, conditions on those uh, increases in global temperatures, we still need to say, well, what's going to be the effect on local temperatures? And there's, of course, very you know, complicated climatological models that do that. Instead of bringing all that in, we're going to follow some of the literature that has said, yes, you know, there's all these complicated models. But you know, there, this kind of linear relationship like this actually works really well in matching the effect on local temperatures. And so that's what we're going to do, where this G is going to depend on location, and we're going to get out of you know, estimating this type of equations using kind of a function of many, many different local characteristics listed in that bullet point. And so you, what you can see, this temp, and so that G uh, we're calling temperature scalar, or the literature calls it a temperature scalar. And it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's plotted here in this map. And so you can see what I was talking about when I say very heterogeneous and uh, spatial effects. So this is just, you know, the actual uh, climate. Uh, the, there's no economics in this graph. So, but you can already see that, you know, a one degree increase. So, so what these numbers mean is like a one degree increase in global temperatures, it increases uh, or so one degree Celsius increase in global temperature it increases local temperature kind of in northern Canada, Alaska, and Siberia there by 2.2 degrees, while in parts of Central America, Australia, Southeast Asia, etc., only by less than half a degree. And so you can see like that, that already gives you huge heterogeneity, right, in the impact of a one degree increase in uh, global temperatures. And, and CO2 essentially mixes really quickly in the atmosphere. So you can think about the carbon cycle as really kind of increasing global temperatures. And then these global temperatures in, in turn having this kind of local effect as described in, in this graph, okay? Now, the key thing then is to think about what is gonna be the effect of those local temperatures or changes in those local temperatures on uh, amenities and productivity. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to recover through this inversion procedure that I described, these fundamental amenities and these fundamental productivities that rationalize the data exactly according to the model, right? And, and we're going to do that for four different years. So for 1990, 95, 2000, and 2005, right? So, and so that's going to give us like a panel of amenities and productivities at this uh, resolution level, right? And by the way, the resolution level, you can see what this, th that this is the resolution that we're using. And these are the one degree by one degree squares that I was talking about. So you can see, uh, you can see the kind of the level of detail that that, that implies. So that's about 23,000 uh, squares in the, in the world that have actually some land. I'm sorry, okay. excuse me. Yeah, I don't know if you hear me, Clement here. Sorry, I couldn't put the video on. Is this? I was um, comparing the map you showed earlier with what I'm uh, teaching my in my course, environment and development. So the IPCC does have these types of maps where it says for one degree, you know, more in global temperature, where do we expect the way do we expect temperature to rise by more? So it has a, a map that's very comparable to the one you produced. Right. The one the one difference, and the that's that's why it struck me is that. I tend to put, to point at uh, regions in Latin America, in Africa, so the you know the south the southern part of Africa and then sub-Saharan part that are actually at 1.25 or 1.3. So the reason why I'm pointing at those is that those are of course extremely poor regions of the world. So it might actually it might actually maybe as a robustness check or so thinking about 
I care about it as a development economist, but thinking about how those poor regions of the world might be more affected than what your model seems to be predicting. Okay, yeah, we'll, I mean, we, we kind of related it to some of the IPCC work and we thought that this kind of map uh, yeah. did it well, but we'll, we'll take a look at the uh, at kind yeah, of- Basically a lot in more green in Africa and in Latin America, yeah. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Uh, okay. So, okay, so so we'll we'll we have this panel right with the, from recovering these kind of fundamental objects in the model, which we, by the way, think it's a big advantage relative to the, the work that actually you know looks at the effect on outcomes, right? Because the whole point is that between these fundamental objects and outcomes, there's the adaptation, there's the reaction of agents in between, right? That we want to model, we want to think about, and we want to we want the, them to react. And so what are, so and, and then we're going to estimate this type of uh, damage functions. So essentially what we want is we want to allow different regions to have different effects or different semi-elasticities of temperature depending on the level of temperature that they have. And so that's the this first uh, part here. So we're going to do it by bins, by temperature bins. And then we're going to allow for... Uh, you know, location fixed effects. We're going to allow for some trends at a, at a slightly more aggregated level. I think some of these are like at the four square level, or some of these are kind of at the at the region, kind of a little bit larger region level. And so, if you estimate this, what you get is uh, the, the the graphs that you see below. And so, so what what, what this shows is so the, the left one is on amenities. What this shows is that like a one degree increase in January, July temperature. Why January, July? Because we're using January for the, the northern hemisphere, July for the southern hemisphere. Um, is uh, it gives you about uh, you know two point five uh, change in amenities, positive change in amenities. If you're one of the coldest areas in the world, so there, you know, obviously higher temperatures are good, are a good thing. So that increases amenities in those places. If you are, on the other hand, in the warmest places in the world right there, you know, you, you lose that about the, the same amount. And so for productivities, you get the same thing. The effects are a little bit larger there and, you know, a little bit more asymmetric in the sense that they are a little bit larger kind of on the upside than on the downside. But the shape is more or less the same. Now, there's, there, I, I should point out that there's, there's kind of substantial uncertainty or, is, or in some sense curve, if you will, crosses zero, right? So that's kind of the ideal temperature, if you will, for either for amenities or for, or for productivities. Again, this is like in, 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 in the winter, right? And you can see that there's kind of substantial uncertainty about that. I mean, we, don't, we really kind of don't know very precisely what the optimal temperature is. It's kind of flat. In that, and so so that kind of uh, is related to the fact that you know there's 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 a lot of uncertainty about exactly the level of this curve, right? So you you see you see you know we can we can estimate some significant effect in the extremes, more less kind of in the middle part, and there's there's substantial uncertainty about the level of these curves, and that has to do with how much effects kind of what's the impact that we've seen uh, so far at least over this uh, period in terms of the actual uh, effects of uh, temperature on both these productivity centers in a minute. Okay? Now, so, so that's the, the, those are gonna be, of, of course, important inputs into, into the exercise. The next thing is we're gonna have uh, fossil, fuel, uh, fossil fuel extraction costs. So, there's, so, the, so, so how costly it is to extract fossil fuels it's going to depend on this kind of uh, productivity level that I was talking with John about. But on top of that, uh, what we know is that, you know, if you keep extracting, uh, if you keep using uh, coal, the, the cost of uh, getting the marginal extra unit of coal increases the more units you've extracted. I mean, you want the image in your head, it's like, you know, it's got more and more costly to go deeper and deeper and deeper to get it. And so, you know, people have estimated what those costs are. And so we're going to use, uh, use that uh, extraction cost curve that is convex like that. So that means that, you know, as you're getting closer and closer to using most of the 
you know, uh, stock carbon that is uh, available for uh, production in, on, on Earth, then uh, the cost of doing of using it kind of increases uh, increase in this particular way. Okay, so that's all I want to. Uh, I'll I'll be, I'll come back to that because that's important in terms of the results uh, that we that I'm going to show you for the effect of uh, carbon taxes in a little while. Okay, so uh, so the, we're going to take the or we're going to compare most of our results with one IPCC, so the annual climate change uh, scenario, which is uh, the, a relatively extreme scenario, which is RCP. So they, they organize this, this scenario using these kind of different severities. And RCP 8.5 is a relatively severe one. So when we run our economy, the way we quantify it, you know, we run this economy, and that's going to generate some endogenous evolution of emissions. That's the green line on this graph, right? And just for reference, I'm, I'm putting there the IPCC emissions, uh, kind of emission curve there, the 8.5 and the 6.0. So we're going to be comparing mostly with the 8.5. And so you can see how we get kind of this, a very similar increase. Ours is uh, it goes a little bit higher than that. And then what they have is this, you know, at some point they say, well, an abatement technology is going to come, and so emissions are just going to drop. We don't, we don't, I mean, we can bring abatement technologies. I'll talk a little bit about abatement technologies, but I mean, that's kind of a dog the way they do it. So in our world, on the other hand, this fossil fuel cost kicks in, right? And so, you know, the cost of uh, carbon becomes higher and higher because you have to get dig deeper and deeper, if you will. That makes it more costly. And so people st stop uh, using carbon. And so that implies that emissions decline. And so that gives you kind of the decline in the, in the green curve. If you look at the effect on global temperatures, uh, which is the, the, the curve on the, on the right, you see that you know, you ma we match that scenario essentially uh, very well. OK, so, so you know, this is extreme. It's an extreme scenario for sure. But you know it's uh, it's similar to the what the IPCC uh, what what the IPCC came up with. Okay, so in that sense, uh, in that sense, kind of it's uh, the model endogenous per is is generating something that is like what this panel of scientists uh, came up with in an extreme uh, in an extreme scenario. So that in turn is going to imply changes in amenities and productivities. And so just to illustrate that. These are the in the baseline scenario. If nothing happens and you know uh, the, the world is getting warmer as described in the curve that I just showed you, then amenities, of course, are going to be affected by it through this damage function that I showed you. Productivity are going to be affected also. And so these are the maps of uh, the different levels of productivities and amenities in the different parts of the world as a result of this. And so you know, you look at the scale. So what this tells you is that by that point, uh, amenities in some of the northern regions are going to increase in by about forty percent, while you know in some in Latin in parts of Brazil and Central Africa, etc., they may decline by about twenty percent or something. While uh, productivities in those areas and actually a kind of a larger area are going to kind of double in this area, and they're going to decrease by about 50% in some of the poorest part of the world. And so, you know, that's kind of that just to just for you to kind of get a sense of what the effects on amenities and productivity will be. That's in turn going to affect also natality rates. But it happens to be the case that in our baseline scenario, the global effect on a natality is relatively small. So this is going to reduce populations by about 30. Uh, so global warming is going to reduce population by about 30 million people, which is obviously in the context of the world total population is small. That's why it's very hard to actually distinguish the two curves there. But what it's going to do is uh, it's going to shift populations around the world. So this is population density in 2200 relative to no warming. And so you can see how population is moving, you know, up north mostly that, you know, many parts of Europe and the U.S. are actually gaining quite a bit of population. And what, uh, you know, relatively losing is parts of Africa, Latin America and India. But, you know, not too much, not too much. Right. Uh, remember, these places can uh, 
gain a lot percent in percentage terms, but they are relatively unpopulated today. So that doesn't mean, you know, huge amounts of people moving there anyway, right? But perhaps, you know, these areas here, the US, Europe, uh, parts of China, Korea, Japan, etc. those are all going to gain population according to this as well, okay, due to climate change. And so you can put it all together and calculate what are the welfare, what's the welfare impact for an agent that is today in a particular location, right, of this phenomenon of global warming, right, relative to a world in which the global warming didn't happen. And so what I have here is the welfare, that welfare number in the map, and then the distribution of those welfare numbers. And so look at the distribution, it's like two mode distribution, right? So there's the countries for which this is not such a big deal that is kind of peaks around the one, a little bit lower than one, right? And then, you know, there's a bunch of areas for which, you know, this is quite a big deal and they're losing about, you know, 10% of their welfare as a result of this. So very unequal and these kind of groups, you know, population into these two classes, the, the class that, you know, loses a lot and the class that doesn't. And, you know, it also the troubling thing when you look at this map is, of course, that all the blue, which are the areas that kind of are going to really suffer as a result of this, right, are the poorest areas in the world, right? So you're really hammering the areas that are the poorest in the world. On the other hand, like the richest part of the world, you know, the U.S., uh, Europe, Japan, that kind of group of latitudes, if you will, they essentially, are, it, they're almost like a wash, right? So they are part of this other peak, right? They don't really get, uh, are going to be affected. And then, of course, there's the northern regions that are going to gain. So those are the ones that are kind of in that tail over there, maybe some parts of Chile and Argentina at the very southern tip. But all the inequality in this welfare measure First of all, it's huge. I mean, like the range is really, really large. But the second thing is, uh, you know, it's exactly affecting the places that are already the poorest places in the world. So that's uh, that's kind of concerning. Uh, now, you know, this is the these are the distribution of impacts. Then, of course, you can calculate. You know, there's a level to this distribution, and that level says, uh, you know, the losses are going to be about, you know, about five and a half percent in terms of welfare. Now, there's, because those damage functions that I showed you, you know, we're really not sure about, you know, the magnitude of those damage, kind of the level of those damage functions, right? As I show you, there's a lot of uncertainty there. We're not getting a super precise estimate. What that means is that, you know, we're uncertain about the effect of climate change, kind of aggregate effects of climate change too. And so these are, you know, the, the intervals, the confidence intervals of the average effect on real GDP and welfare of this. And so, you know, it could be from zero, which would be, you know, one in this graph, the relative welfare when in, with, a, a, with a climate change relative or with global warming relative to no global warming, or 20%. So this is a huge interval, right? It's all kind of a negative. It's a huge interval. You know, by 2200, you get about 10%. But, uh, but we're really unsure about those aggregate level effects. What we're not so unsure about, though, is the range of the distribution of effects across places, right? So here is for the different scenarios, like low to 95%, high 95% for that curve of damages, right? The distribution of welfare effects, which is the one that like the two big distribution that I showed you a minute ago, and so you can see how, you know, obviously, whether we go to the worst scenario or the best case scenario, you know, you're shifting that distribution up and down, but, uh, but the range of that distribution doesn't change that much, which tells you that, you know, the, the difference, kind of the relative effect of the winners relative to the losers is actually not changing as we move across uh, scenarios so much, and so that we are relatively more certain about, okay? So we know about those effects. One, one kind of a big advantage we think of, uh, of having a model like the one we're putting forward is that we can think about adaptation and the role that adaptation plays in determining those welfare effects that I was uh, showing you a minute ago. And so there's three key 
adaptation mechanisms in this mom. There's the fact that people move, can move. And so, you know, if one, one particular area is heavily affected, that allows people to go somewhere else, subject to these migration costs that we talked about. There is the fact that people can trade. And so that kind of ameliorates the effect of, uh, of the shock too. And there's the effect that you can potentially go somewhere else, go to Siberia, invest there, improve technology in Siberia, and you know, sh slowly but surely, create some wonderful places there for production in Siberia as temperatures uh, increase. So, so those three adaptation mechanisms. And so we wanted to gouge kind of the importance of the different adaptation mechanisms. So the first one is migration here. And so what I have here is like the diff and diff, right? Of, you know, climate, no climate, migration, no migration, right? And so red areas are areas that, you know, would gain from current migration costs relative to a world in which migration costs are 25% larger everywhere, okay? So it's a kind of an increase in migration costs everywhere. And so what you see is obviously, you know, the, the northern areas lose, so that's kind of, a, you know, easy to predict, I guess. More complicated to, to think about is the fact that India, China, and, and Central Africa also lose. So you would think that those are the places that in some sense are going to suffer from the fact that people are moving out. But those are places where, you know, uh, if migration is more costly, they are getting poorer, natality rates grow a lot, and they get very congested. And that effect kind of implies that they actually prefer kind of lower mig migration costs up. Now, that's very different than South America and Australia. South America and Australia, these are places that are also kind of hammered by climate change, right? But they, and, and so people want to leave those places or some, some people leave those places, but they actually, that's very bad for them because that kind of depopulates those places. And that implies that their market size decreases, which implies less innovation and less growth in those locations. And so kind of your, the level of your density really kind of affects how the higher migration costs are gonna affect you. Now, the, the graph on the right, what I have is, uh, you know, the, the welfare, average welfare facts of uh, warming for different levels of these migration costs, so 25% increase or 12.5% or, or increase. And what you see is like with 25% increase, you kind of almost, you know, um, double the effects of, of climate change. So what that means is, uh, you know, people are using this migration mechanism to adapt to climate change. This is an important adaptation mechanism in the model. And if you increase the cost of it, climate change becomes a much uh, more severe phenomenon in terms of its welfare effects. So this is, so migration is kind of key for this, and its effects are kind of quite subtle depending on kind of the level of congestion that you have in, uh, in the location. So I only have a few minutes left, so let me summarize. Okay, so, you know, we, we, we look at other uh, mechanisms. So trade is um, more... Uh, you know, the, the map here more, looks more than like what you would expect, higher trade costs uh, affect or, or, or hurt, you know, the places uh, that, uh, that are more affected by, by climate change. But, you know, overall, these effects are kind of fairly small. And the reason is that, you know, in this particular setup that I showed you, climate is only affecting, you know, there's no, in the same way, all production, there's no sectoral component to this. Uh, and because of that, and because climate is kind of a spatially correlated shock, in trade is also very local, right? That implies that trade is not a great adaptation mechanism for this, unless, you know, you have very kind of important sectoral components. So we have other work where we're explore, exploring those sectoral uh, aspects or sectoral dimension of climate change. Here, it doesn't show as very important. The last adaptation mechanism is innovation. Innovation is actually also kind of subtle, and it's uh, the, the, and kind of the main effect is it's a very kind of spatial effect. So if I make innovation more expensive, right? Obviously, you know all the adaptation that is happening towards the north 
uh, is more costly. So, th so it affects the northern regions for sure, right? But, the, but the, one of the, its main effects is also that if I make innovation more costly, that means that less people go to, over time, move and produce, and there's less concentration of production in India and China. And so that because those places are going to be then hammered by climate change, they're going to be very highly affected by climate change. That's actually good for the effects of climate change. You know, you prevent that concentration. And by preventing that concentration, you ameliorate or you diminish the effects of, uh, of climate change because the world concentrates less in areas, in production, in areas that will be affected down the road by climate. Okay, so a couple of minutes. Uh, let me talk about, I mean, we do different types of policies. Let me just show you carbon taxes and then I'll conclude. So if, um, you can put in different policies and kind of trace their effect. Uh, obviously, a very popular one is carbon taxes. So here's the effect of uh, different levels of carbon taxes. We try 50%, 100%, 200%, all uniform across locations, rebated locally. The 200 one would be similar to what like the Swedish tax today is, just to give you kind of an idea. So obviously, you know, uh, the carbon tax reduces carbon emissions at impact. But what it does essentially is it shifts this emissions curve, you know, it shifts it, um, it shifts it so that we consume carbon, we consume almost the same amount of carbon, we just consume it later. Why is that? Because, you know, if you don't consume it today, then the cost of extracting carbon in the future don't go up. And so that's an more carbon in the future, right? And so that, you know, goes down, you know, and temperatures go down, but essentially what you're doing is like, you're flattening the curve. You're flattening the temperature curve by, with the carbon tax, right? You are reducing temperatures today, but eventually you kind of get to the same point because eventually, um, you know, the carbon is, um, is used. And so what that implies is that this is gonna have, you know, cost today, benefits tomorrow, and, and you know, the final effect of the carbon tax whether it's a good thing or not, it's gonna depend a lot on the discount rate. How do you value the current cost relative to the you know, future benefit that it brings uh, together? But those are not super large, partly because if I you know, value all generations by the same amount, right? By having a very uh, low discount rate, that implies that the fact that carbon is eventually gonna be used, uh, is gonna be uh, used, uh, doesn't reduce, you know, you don't reduce the overall use that much, you just delay its use uh, to future generations. And so that at the end of the day doesn't have huge, uh, a huge impact, which is kind of different than what you get in your standard framework, it's cert certainly in the simplistic, uh, you know, taxation kind, of, uh, kind of logic, okay? And now, of course, as we, and I'll finish with this, as with the epidemiology literature, flattening the curve is really useful if a vaccine is coming. Same way with temperature, flattening the curve is really useful if there's an abatement technology coming, right? So if, if, if eventually there's gonna be a technology that is gonna solve this problem by extracting carbon from the atmosphere or by you know sequestering carbon be before we emit it, then of course delaying is, is, is huge. And then the carbon tax, certainly the, the, the benefits of the carbon tax are much, much larger. We try, like I said, different other policies uh, like clean energy subsidies. Clean energy subsidies do very little in this framework because essentially they do create substitution between uses of energy, but they also I increase the total amount of energy used. And so at the end of the day, their effect on, on climate is uh, relatively small. Okay, so thanks for the invitation again. This is, um, what are we trying to do? We're trying to bring in a new assessment model that you know takes into account the heterogeneous effects in space, and in particular, the type of adaptation mechanisms that are important once you recognize that the effects are heterogeneous in space. And we think it has uh, many kind of insights that come out of these models that in general have not come out of uh, the current uh, assessment models. And one of the big ones is the fact that these welfare losses are incredibly heterogeneous and are particularly large and negative 
for places that are very poor today. So when we think about the effect of climate, in particular global warming, on the world economy, highlighting that heterogeneity is crucial. And we think this is one tool that can be used to assess that. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Esteban. Uh, we had plenty of activity in the chat and in the Q&A, and Jose Luis had his hands full during your presentation. But now let me open the floor. Uh, so I think uh, uh, Joan has a question. Joan, please go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have a, a, a couple of, of, of small questions. The first one is, so in your context, uh, what does productivity really mean, right? Because, I mean, it's easy to think about how temperature affects productivity uh, for agriculture. But when there may be different sectors, I'm a little bit less less clear about. And the second one is how sensitive are your estimates to potentially the elasticity of substitution between clean energy and carbon, right? How much does this affect the total carbon emissions and the dynamic effects that, that, you, that you've talked about? Yeah, great. These are great questions. So, so the first one is uh, what exactly are we talking when we're talking about TV? So this is this is we we don't we're not separating by sector right and so you know obviously the, the agricultural part is clear i mean like agronomers have told us you know that there's an effect there but the the ones on manufacturing etc are a little bit more subtle you know people there's there's a bunch of papers out there that have uh, documented you know less uh, workers having less energy or less enthusiasm you know missing work more more cost of cooling the workplace i mean there there's a there's a bo bunch of uh, effects like that but uh you know and i guess you know some people are gonna kill me for saying what i'm gonna say but i'm gonna say it anyway is like you know at the end of the, the day all the most productive places in the world right are in a in a particular band of the world that has very specific temperatures really we don't have really the statistical power to say that that's climate but is the is the big elephant in the room it's a huge it's, it's like a huge coincidence right uh so so you know now in the mall it's a it's a catch-all right the same way tfp in the world economy it's a, a you know it's very hard to decompose exactly what that tfp effect is uh, or what those changes there's it's all sorts of things this idea is the fact that maybe in some climates is easier to um, try certain technologies it's easier to uh, everything is there uh, unpacking that is certainly is certainly an important an important endeavor but not one that we've done uh, here so far now the elasticity of substitution that's a that I like a lot the discussion on the elasticity of substitution because I, up here we have like a CS between clean energy and fossil fuels. It's one number, 1.6 is our number that we get from a bunch of uh, studies out there in the literature, which is you know relatively highly substitutable. Some of the other people have used the numbers that are relatively small or are smaller than that. Obviously, it depends on the installed capital, right? So at the end of the day, it's like a policy variable really that elasticity of substitution in the sense that if my car is is like a gasoline based car a fossil fuel based car I, 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 there's no substitution for me right i mean condition on having that piece of equipment i have to con consume fossil fuels the moment i have an electric car i don't care i'm perfectly elastic between the two right and so whatever brings it to my to my outlet at home right so and so it, it depends on the installed capital. It depends on the on the, on the everything you know, the whole production structure in some sense of the economy. What type of energy that production structure in the economy that type of, that those machines and that capital, etc., can or cannot use. And so it's definitely a policy parameter. We are using reduced form number there. Now that number change probably changes over time. One and second. Is probably affected by uh, policy itself, and so bringing that in is cer certainly kind of a one area where more, much more work can be uh, can be done. I think, uh, and and it's it's, it's it's something that that uh, you know we've been thinking a little bit about. Um. 
Okay, let me continue with uh, Frederic. Uh, I think Frederic sa had some questions that uh, Jose Luis didn't have time to answer yet. So maybe Frederic, you want to ask uh, Esteban? Yeah, so I had a question about the migration technology. So th that's pretty clear that if, if people can, can move, this, this is very good and it uh, reduces the welfare losses uh, in the most affected regions. But we, we know that, and we are migration scholars here, that uh, high-skilled people face much smaller migration costs than low-skilled people. So I was wondering whether you have skills in this model. I, I forgot that. I, I spoke with Close a long time ago, but I forgot that. And suppose that you relax migration constraints and you, you don't neutralize or kill this advantage that high-skilled people have. So could it be the case that high-skilled people will have the possibility to leave and the low skilled who are trapped in the most affected regions would be worse off at the end of the day. Right. Uh, no, so this model doesn't have skill. So it's all, so, you know, so we cannot differentiate by skill in that sense. We're working actually on one extension of this framework that does introduce skill that has a with all of its challenges, including, you know, those differences in mobility patterns that you described. Um, so far, we haven't incorporated that. And so the mobility, so like this mobility cost that we're uncovering, right, in the exercise, in the quantitative exercise that, that we're doing are net in the sense that, you know, whoever lives in that location, you know, we're asking the question, how much you know do people move or come into that particular location and what are the costs that account for that right and so in that sense it's a little bit of a mixture of your population and the actual cost right so if you if your population is like very skilled and so they're kind of very easily move out then i'm going to also interpret that wrongly as a lower migration cost out of that area, while in some place that is very poor, I'm going to say, well, migration costs are really high there because, you know, I don't see anyone move out of that place, even though it's kind of a dismal economy, right? And, and I see that through the income in that location. And so, you know, I'm covering a little bit uh, about that with the level of the migration costs that I'm uncovering that is coming so that the model exactly matches the net population changes in these different cells, right? So that's the extent to which we are covering it. But I'm with you that, you know, introducing skills and the fact that, you know, this can, on top of the type of inequality across regions that we're talking about, it, it, it could be, there's a whole other dimension of inequality across skills within regions. And also, you know, the complementarities between the two, that is an important topic that, that you know, one should, study for sure. Uh, so I, 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 I agree with that. Thank you. Okay, same for uh, Michel. Michel, do you want to go? Okay, no, it was just a simple question about this uh, issue of trap population, because as Frederic said, uh, this is one of the most, in uh, most important features of uh, the impact of climate change is that uh, in many regions of the world, I mean, productivities are going to fall, income are going to fall. And if you combine that with migration costs and also migration costs that are policy induced by destination countries, it means that many people are not going to be able to move. So I wanted to see to what extent uh, it is a, an important outcome of the model. Uh, yeah. So that is, the, it is an essential, uh, and I'm going to add one extra mechanism to what you, I mean, everything that you said is very much there. One extra mechanism that is there is that if you're a country, you'll get poorer, right? As a result of climate change, then people there are also going to have more children, right? Because they're poorer. And so there's like a quantity quality trade off there. And so that means that populations, local populations are going to kind of also grow as a result of that relative to the scenario without climate change. So on top of that, you're kind of going to put more, even more people in that location. And that's why when you uh, increase um, migration costs, some of these areas kind of in Central Africa really suffer as a result of that kind of in terms of the effect of climate is worse in these areas than in other areas. So that's kind of this kind of congestion type of effect that I was talking about before. 
So, so in some sense, when there, there, there's this mechanism, which is that if I take people from some of these areas that are affected, kind of one of the best ways to improve the, the effects or, or ameliorate the effects of, of climate change is to today take a person in Central Africa and move it to Europe, not only because obviously that person is going to be better off, which we know, but also because its whole dynasty coming out of that person is going to be smaller as a result of that move, right? Because they're going to tend to have less children. And because of that, um, you know, there's going to be less population in the future world, which is going to also consume less resources and, and emit less CO2 into the atmosphere in the future. Yeah, so, this feedback effect of uh, immigration policy is interesting, but it's a little bit at odds with what we see uh, nowadays. You know that New Zealand introduced and uh, after that they canceled their uh, uh, climate visa, uh, visas that uh, they gave initially to uh, uh, Pacific Islander, I, I forgot uh, which island it was. So basically this feedback effect of immigration policy that uh, tra uh, traditional destination countries would uh, issue more visas to, uh, to offset these uh, effect of climate change and uh, climatic migrants. I mean, for, for the moment, we don't see that. Uh, we, we don't see that. But I mean, there's a lot of things that are uh, not consistent between the model and the policy that is put, actually put in place. So I'm not going to claim that we can explain yeah, yeah, <laughs> the political economy process that leads to these policies for sure. But uh, but I mean, I, but I didn't know that that that, that case of New Zealand. So we, I, I think that's a, that's an interesting example because in some sense, much more than anything that what you, you can do. Uh, in terms of convincing some of these countries and the ability to convince these countries to, to you know, um, change their behavior in terms of energy use, if you actually let them in, right, that, that could have a much bigger impact. So that has to be part of the, the discussion when we think about green policies. I will send information about New Zealand. Okay. That, that, thank you. That would be great. Okay, so Esteban, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think Chaglar, in the end, do you want to ask a final question, Chaglar, or will we leave it here? No, yeah, my question was there. You have a lot of endogenous responses. Michelle kind of asks it, uh, but the policy, migration policy, environment, you're assuming it's static. I mean, and we do see like with the refugee crisis or anything else, there's going to be a huge uh, response in the des main destination countries because presumably the way I'm gathering from the model, they will not want flood of climate refugees right i mean there's a there's a kind of congestion type mm, of exactly. on amenities right and so people exactly. in some sense don't like it in in exactly the way that you 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 were alluding to yeah. now there is another effect which is that over time to the extent that these people become consumers that increases market size which encourages innovation so 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 having people, I mean, and that's like the process kind of in Siberia and kind of in the less populated areas, it's good to send people yes. there independently okay. of who they are because mm -hmm. populating them is kind of the first step in developing them, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, so, and so those two things kind of uh, are, are, are in, you know, in contrast uh, and both are operating in the model. So what comes out depends a little bit on the size of the two the two mechanisms. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks. a lot. Uh, thanks okay, for. Okay. Thank uh, you, everyone, for the comments. Thank you. And uh, for all your comments and questions, and uh, we'll be back uh, next week. So see you. Bye.